welcome to uh, Think Commons. Sorry for the late time, uh, but we are still very, very excited. I'm very happy to have here Omar Nagati from El Cairo. He's an architect, urban planner, researcher, and teacher. He he teaches at uh, Del Cairo and where he also has his own practice and we are very happy to have him here because since we met him uh, we, we learned so much from meeting him and from experience El Cairo with him that we really wanted him to be here and to share his experience with, with all of us and now this is time for him to, to speak about his main focus in his practice which is informal urbanism uh, in, in general terms. Now he's gonna, he's gonna tell us more about what are his concerns and his interests. So welcome, Omar, and Thank you. I'm gonna be here, so if I can be helpful somehow, <laughs> I will be happy. Thank you, uh, well, thank you for uh, having me. I'm very excited, I'm very happy. This is my first time to be in Madrid officially. I've been passing the airport a couple of times. Such an exciting city, so much to learn, particularly the way the city um, engages its citizen and the public space is very, very important. And the Vasorama's projects, as well as other projects in the city, I've been walking through Madrid the last two days, nonstop, frantic, trying to absorb all these experiments, successful or not too successful, but the idea of using public space as an active framework to engage the society and engage the citizen is something that we need to learn from. Uh, now, I, I come here with a not very structured uh, presentation. It's part of the Cairo experience. Everything is informally organized. I have a couple of uh, presentations that I presented during the last year, since January 2011, that I would like to share with everybody. Uh, my interest in Cairo uh, goes back maybe 20 years ago when I was still a young architect, uh, graduated from Cairo University, and I was always interested in the streets and public spaces and the way people use the street in a way that is completely different than what is planned or intended by planners or by government or by architects. So there is sort of almost paradox or mismatch between the way city is designed to be versus the way city is used. Some people see it as chaos. I see it more as an alternative order. And I, I, in my, when I was asked to present an image for my talk, I chose this image, uh, which is, okay, I'm having a little bit of problem getting the, okay, there you go. Uh, I think it's here actually. Sorry, I'm just a little. I'm gonna start with these two images, which I posted or somebody posted. These two images, I always start with, these are, to me, very paradigmatic. They are key, iconic images. One of them is from Tahrir Square during one of the one million person demonstration. This is during the Friday prayer. And the second one is from a typical, what I call informal fabric that sort of constitutes up to 70% of the city. It's built based on this. Um, city fabric. To me, the two, s the two images are similar in different way because they all represent an alternative order or geometry of the city, the way city organi organizes itself from below. And each one of these two structures, they are structures, they are not chaotic, they are not um, uh, random, uh, but they start from the individual as opposed from the center. So, for example, the image on the top is an image uh, during the prayer, and the prayer, during the prayer, everybody lines up for 15 minutes to pray, and it's, this structure is completely organized based on three rules. Each individual has to face certain direction, that is Mecca. Each individual has to line with the, his or her uh, side fellow Muslims praying and you have to leave between you and the person in front of you enough space to prostrate. These three rules generate everything. It can be in the desert, it could be in Mecca, it could be in the street, it could be at your home, but exactly the same rules generate this order. And this order is very 
could be very strict, but it's also a little bit flexible. So although people are supposed to be aligned exactly, but there's a set of tolerance and margin of tolerance. So there's a bit of flexibility which generates this kind of almost grid, but it's not exactly a grid. And that's completely different from a mechanical order where, for example, soldiers are, are aligned. That's very different. In the same way, if you look at city, if you compare this fabric to, let's say, a grid in Manhattan or in Madrid, where the streets are are, are planned in a very strict geometrical order. We call it iron grid in planning terms. This is the opposite. This is not planned or pre-planned. It is generated by individual units stacked next to each other. So every unit organizes itself. Every person builds his or her own house in relationship to your neighbor, either your next, next door neighbor or in front of you. So leaving enough space for ventilation or aligning the windows for privacy or uh, you know tilting your thing to get the, the the air or sun so but the same rule system for each individual in sort of accretion or more uh, close to each other generate this overall structure so to, to me this is what's fascinating about Cairo this is what I like to work on Cairo and I think the revolution in many ways is sort of an intensification of a process that is very is much much longer than January or the third last thirty years or the last century. Cairo's centuries old, and this process has always been the key geometrical order that created the city over centuries. So we're just kind of almost getting touch back to uh, a very very old. Uh, I, I hate the word indigenous, but you can quote unquote indigenous sort of process of uh, of, uh, of of building or structuring. So what I would like to talk about first in the first part of the presentation is about the, the, what is Cairo, for those who are not familiar with Cairo, why, why did the revolution happen? All the things that, pre, like, to me, it's an urban revolution. Uh, there are some conditions in Cairo uh, over the last three or four decades that led to this explosion or implosion or re urban revolt. And then what is so important during the revolution from a, from a, from somebody who was interested in public space, what, how was public space transformed and restructured during the 18 days? And then, the, and then the third part would be: so since January till now, a year and a half ago, what has been the implication, the ramification of this urban revolt in the way people perceive and use and reconstitute public space that is different from two years ago? So this is exactly the, basically the narrative that I would like to suggest. And I'm, I'm very open to interjection or questions. And uh, I'm going to be moving between different presentations to try to make it as comprehensive without being too fragmentary. So please bear with me. So, so the first part is, um, well, just talking about Cairo is a city, uh, you know, the stereotype, the cliche is a city of contradiction. I think every city has its own contradiction. But when you look at Cairo, Cairo has, you can look at it as an opposition between formal order and informal order. In the same way, a 19th century city was a colonial versus local or native. Today, the juxtaposition is between two cities. And we're going to see some maps at some points. So these two images are contrasting some sort of a new development that's taking, care, taking place in the last 40 years. To the right is what I call informal housing. And this informal housing constitutes, as I said, 70% of the building stock. And these are people, these are not squatters, it's not favelas, it's not barrios, these are people owning the land, but they're building on agricultural land, so they're illegal in terms of building on land designated for different use. But they own the land, they're building buildings that are structurally sound, these are not shabby, these are not slums, but they are lacking certain infrastructure, they are lacking certain uh, public services like hospitals and schools and oh, gardens and but everybody builds his or her own house in a way that is reasonable kind of standard I would say perfect standard so so this is one order and the opposite is what the state has been proposing the last 30 or 40 years which is leaving the city center the, the city core and going out in the desert and building new cities and these new cities one of them is shown to the left is a um, these are modeled on American suburban dream, basically. So there are golf courses, swimming pool, villas, completely disconnected. Of course, they cater from a, to a very 
small per percentage of Egyptian society, the privileged minority, uh, and they're completely disconnected from the, the majority of people who are living in this kind of condition that is not, there is no, almost no, nobody talking to each other. It's completely two different conditions. So this is sort of the first juxtaposition. Um, and, and the other thing is this juxtaposition is also highlighted by certain, I wouldn't say segregation, but there is certain exclusion. So the, the relationship between the two sides of the city are defined by certain infrastructure, like a railroad, for example, that define the edge of one versus the other. And the access point between the two parts of the city are very limited to certain uh, almost bottlenecks, uh, which intensifies this sense of um, duality and create this immediate juxtaposition that makes it sound very dramatic. Hmm? Uh, so the people move from one side to the other side to work, to study, to go to hospitals, and then go back to their neighborhood that is lacking most of, most of these uh, services. Um, this, this segregation and, I would say, exclusion also happens inside the city proper through different levels. So, for example, when you need to have a highway connecting the city center to one of these new desert communities, you have to build this highway. And this highway cuts one of these informal neighborhoods into two halves. So you are dividing a neighborhood to connect the, the sort of the, the middle class. So the middle class connect from this, the city center to the uh, suburban desert uh, compounds, we call compounds. But at the same time, these connectors is also a divider because you cut this uh, this informal community in two halves, so we have to have these bridges, so I have this kind of segregation uh, uh, by means of, of elevator. And this is another, another sense of segregation on the Nile front when you have you know, five stars, <laughs> boats and, 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 and restaurants connected by elevated bridges, whereas the public path is, is, is at separate levels. So you have kind of uh, a lack of encounter and lack of mix in some part of the city. Uh, I, I say all, all, this, all these conditions are also uh, uh, sort of were, were dramatized in the last 10, 15 years because Cairo, for one reason or other, it had a government, a new liberal regime that looked for a model like Dubai for inspiration. I was just talking uh, uh, on, on our way here it's, uh, how, how, how um, silly or absurd to, for a city like Cairo with all this density and history and experience to look for model for, for Dubai and called Cairo Dubai on the Nile. So you look at this kind of grand boulevard uh, to, 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 and, and this grand vision of global connectivity and, and all this slogan about you know, uh, global cities and green cities. And so this is one of the visions of the last uh, government to connect the city to the pyramids, which you can see in the back here. And this boulevard is, I don't know, 100 or 200 meters wide. And of course, you had to demolish a lot of buildings. So the idea of not taking into account what's tech happening on the ground, but having this kind of blueprints, almost like a house mania, house mania and kind of reincarnation of houseman today in a very massive, radical, authoritarian kind of move um, uh, that makes it almost impossible to comprehend, like w what were they thinking? This is another image of the same, this is called Cairo 2050 vision. Another Nile front that the, the idea was to demolish some of these densely populated neighborhoods, historic fabric, and build these towers, glass towers, or not, to have the kind of business district, a la Dubai, or a la, you know, this kind of Qatar or Doha or something. So, so Cairo becomes, it's competing with this kind of global capitalism according to this uh, uh, vision. And the, the, uh, the Nile is the prime view, the prime land, and everything around the Nile has to be and uh, so the area around the pyramids, the area around the Nile, the area of city center has to be reclaimed from the people who don't know the value of it, quote unquote. And then in turn, built into high capital invest, inve capital in intensive uh, projects uh, like skyscraper and office spaces and, and five stars hotels. Uh, and then the city becomes this sort of magnificent, um, you know. Now, so, so, so if, you, if you look at Cairo within that context, so Cairo basically, can, you can look at Cairo, if you sit back and say, okay, the Cairo has, in terms of urbanism, we have three conditions. You have the, the old or the historic city agglomeration, the city that has gradually developed over the last, you know, 10 centuries or something, uh, till maybe the mid 20th century, 
or the late 20th century. And then you have two new trajectories that started with the 70s. One of them is the informal belt I was talking about, and the other one is the desert community. So these three different conditions sort of define Cairo today. If you go to Cairo, you can all, all automatically identify these three conditions. So w w w with this, in context, you have this grand moment of, of explosion. The city exploded. People were fed up. Everybody who, every visitor I had, you know, when ca came to Cairo before they were said like, how can people, how, how come people are still, you know, silent? Or why, why, why are not people protesting? Why? So everybody was kind of curious, what is, when, it, when was, would, would be the moment? It was not a question of if, it was a question of when. So it was meant to happen that people were going to protest, to, to revolt against this urban injustice, urban oppression. Uh, and then the moment came, for, for particularly any circumstance, that's not the topic new. But what happened is, during that moment, uh, many things could be, uh, uh, could be talked about. Tahrir Square, I was talking earlier today with another colleague of mine. Tahrir took different meaning during that, during that time. It was, it was no longer the traffic roundabout, but it became a site for uh, it's, it's aside for uh, it's a symbol for a new utopian urban order. Uh, it's a city within the city, a city in which uh, people are co-citizens, men and women are alike. Nobody get harassed. Muslims and Christians, liberals and Islamists, rich and poor, old and young. Everybody stood shoulder to shoulder, and it became almost like a cultural grinder. Uh, and I was also like. I also like to invoke, and I, I wrote about that, uh, after the first four or five very violent days, the square became transformed into a, a very interesting metaphor uh, in Egyptian folk. We have an anthropologist with us a, a, called the Moulid, or a saint's birthday. It's like a, it's like a medieval fair. And the Moulid is a, is a cultural container uh, based on the myth of regeneration. So there's a a sheikh or a, a saint who died, or didn't, doesn't matter, but he or she is buried there, and people go there to, for blessing. And around his or her birthday, a fair is, 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 is set up, and this fair is about martyrdom, is about renewal, is about regeneration, and people go to and visit, and, and Tahrir became a site for visitation, so people would go and then go around, almost around this circle, in a very evocative, circumambulating kind of image, like going to Mecca. So, so, so it, was, it, it, it really transcended the idea of protest. People would go with their kids and their family for a visit to Tahrir. And they would go and just go around and check the different you know, speeches and artwork and performances and graffiti. And they go sit somewhere and have tea or coffee and then come back and do a little, a little circle and they go home. So it became almost like a pilgrimage site. And to me that was very powerful because Many of the many of these images that I show here are this like there are tons of images that produce out there. But what I'm interested in how some of these elements or streetscapes were, were completely took different meaning during this event. So, for example, these uh, cones, traffic cones, were used to, as helmets to protect the fighters during the the fight. Huh? Uh, the sidewalk was deassembled and used as ammunition. Uh, the, the traffic kind of barriers we use as barricades. Um, uh, uh, side streets we use as field hospitals. So, th so, so what I, what I, what I, what I, what I like. This is a very interesting. I think it's a BBC. It's a BBC um, image in which they really look at Tahrir in terms of uh, structure. So the street, the, the Tahrir was completely restructured into a new meaning, socially constructed into a new meaning. So you have a public toilets, the field hospital, the stage, the, the barriers, the entrance gate, the checkpoint. So you no longer, you can no longer see what was the space about. This traffic kind of organization has become completely meaningless, irrelevant. Hmm? And it's a new meaning is taken over due to the, the, the protests, but also due to a certain uh, 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 order that I was referring to before, order generated by individuals and a community as opposed to an or a top-down order by planners or, or government officials. Um, also, the, the city itself uh, was reimagined, reconstructed 
during the month after the revolution. So whenever there's a new call for a, a march or a tahrir rally, you know, you have this map set, set sent by, you know, Facebook or something, identify key locations uh, to gather and march to tahrir. So the city was remapped for from a revolutionary kind of perspective. So instead of having, let's say, the main highways, the main traffic nodes, you have the key churches and mosques as gathering. But it's a new structure, which is to me is very interesting, and, and, and there's an abstraction to it. So the cities became abstracted into a diagram. So you have these small neighborhoods gathering at these larger nodes, into larger nodes, and finally to Tahrir. And each node was named after one of the martyrs. So, so the city was kind of reimagined, re, re-scripted, rewritten in the collective consciousness. And, and of course, it's interesting because these martyrs were very carefully chosen to represent the different uh, um, threads of society. So the Azharai, the traditional Muslim, one of the Coptic martyrs during the Maspiro, uh, one of the Islamists, one of the liberals. So they were chosen carefully so that they were more inclusive. So. So this diagram is almost representative of this kind of idea of the container I was talking about earlier, but it's more an abstract diagram. So this is a city is, has been reconstructed and rewritten during these 18 days. Um, and um, some of this, some of the um, settings, I think like in Madrid, uh, the spaces are now remembered for a completely different event. So this bridge is very famous, Qasri Nil Bridge with the two lines, is now associated with people with this huge battle that took place between the police and, and the people, and the people won. And, and that was the moment, the turning point, when the people just took over uh, this image to the right, and the, and, and the, and the bridge became, a, and the battle of the camel is also another one that has been mediated because of this kind of uh, uh, absurd kind of uh, use of the camels and horses and thugs to intimidate the people, but this this space became the battle of the camel side. Um, also, uh, people reclaimed the space not only for political purposes but for political and cultural expression, artistic expression. So, since the revolution, we have a, an explosion of graffiti in Cairo everywhere. It's something that has been written about now a lot, and this graffiti is becoming almost like a it's like a mania, huh? like you know, everywhere there's graffiti, and they paint it over, and then they do it again and again and again and again, and there are now different iteration of the same theme. First against Mubarak, then against the police, now against the military, and and now the people are you know making jokes about different factions, uh, but also in some spaces you start to have art fairs. Some spaces that were off limit because they're outside main institutions uh, have become sites for street festivals and art, and one of these spaces we're going to collaborate together this summer to do a uh, an installation. Uh, so again, this idea of quote-unquote reclaiming public space is not only for political protest but also for cultural and art. So art moved out of the white box or the black box, the gallery, and, and now it's spilling over everywhere in Cairo. Uh, whenever you go, you found this in every neighborhood. Uh, some of the new vocabulary was also is very interesting. So for example, this patch, eye patch, uh, this is one of the famous lines at the bridge. Uh, one of the f- key definitive battles in Muhammad Mahmoud, uh, the victims were, were mostly people who lost their eyes because the, the military was firing rubber bullets, aiming at their eyes. So there are a number of wounded people who lost, one of, one of the guys lost two eyes, but most of them lost one eye, and this kind of one-eyed kind of martyr or one-eyed patriot or hero uh, was kind of glorified by every single monument in the city was that's another way of expression huh? um, you know some some like you think the the, the 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 bullets and the cartouche and and, and to, to the the ammunition to create artwork hmm? uh, this is the, the bottom one is interesting because this is the response of the military to say we are still one hand with the people so they had this kind of very funny poster of a military person carrying a baby and that's that's we're not actually against you we're with you and see the image say so it's a very kind of almost childish kind of response propaganda uh, to, to to the people who are chanting against the military and uh, so that's responsible to have this poster which is very very interesting Yanni, to say the least um, 
new forms of uh, public work uh, in, in different ways. This, these two are actually talking about, you know, public art. These two were mo uh, martyrs monuments that were constructed by the people, different groups. One of them was this, the obelisk and has the name of the martyrs. One of them was like a lighthouse, less elaborate, but has the... So that was, I think, this was during the first anniversary of the revolution, and people like decided to, to, to construct this uh, thing. And then and the bottom two is also another interesting kind of ramification. Of the room. After the first month or two, people were no longer unified behind one goal to topple Mubarak. So we have different groups. So the Islamist has their own agenda. The pro-military has their own agenda. The liberals have their own agenda. Uh, so one of the key things that happened was that this rise of we call it Salafi or Orthodox Islamists and one of their key uh, one of their interventions to, to, to lay claim to their rise in is to cover one of the statues that they found it's inappropriate or is, you know religiously inappropriate to do that so this is like a some sort of Greek or classic kind of statue with some half naked miniature or something so they covered it as, as a way, this is not appropriate. It's like you know, Saudi Arabia. You're not supposed to have figurative art. So, so, so again, the city is not only not only the streets and spaces are being restructured, but even icons are being redefined in terms of meaning, hmm? or new ones are being constructed, like graffiti. But this is the third dimensional. Uh, uh, the city has al also has been restructured physically because of the barriers on the walls. Every new every month we had a uh, some sort of an event, a battle or a street fight. After which, uh, the military builds walls and closes the street to make segregation. So this is sort of a typical view of one of the street fights. But then the city. I'm going to show you another image of uh, some of these streets were completely closed and traffic is rerouted. So the city became it's almost like going to Lebanon during the civil war or. The security, the, the security wall in Israel, or the apartheid wall in Israel between the two. So we have these cement walls cutting streets into halves, and you have to go to cross. You have to go around a big loop. So, so the city has become not just imaginatively different, but practically in terms of everyday practice. You had to change your routine. So I have to walk from here to the next door. So it took me like half an hour to go around. So um, it's not a matter of convenience, but it's about like structuring this. So this is one of the walls here. So they would build. So this is one of the big battles that the, one of the buildings was set on fire. So in response, uh, SCAF or the military they built they built concrete blocks. And now this downtown is full of this. After you left, you'll call, you'll be surprised how many of those. So so this is also affecting uh, the city uh, functioning and. Um, and this is the last image of this process, and I, I'm very interested in this kind of ritual. Uh, so this monument, the people, this I think made of, of plywood or something, but the people brought it on a truck, they paraded the square, and then this kind of ritual of erecting it and firework and music. It's an incredible event, like a, a symbolic part and, 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 and the communal event and how people interact. Uh, to me, that was as important as what is said on the object. You know, it could be a completely different thing, but the fact that people are using it as a mobilizing for sort of the concretize to uh, consolidate all their aspiration into a certain object, eh? be that an obelisk or a minaret or whatever. So, so this is sort of the, an overview of the process uh, before and during and immediately after. Now, I have been interested since the, the, the revolution to, to work on uh, documenting some of the practices that took place in the city uh, that were almost unim unimaginable before. So yes, the city has always been a space for people taking over public space in a, in a certain way, like taking over the sidewalk by peddlers or parking or in front of the shop claiming it. But these are very, almost now footnotes compared to what happened after because since the revolution, because of the state, at some point was completely dissolved and now it's still vulnerable. So people are taking advantage, communities are taking advantage of this condition and uh, start to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So that ranges from, as I said, from you know, taking over the sidewalk to uh, building an extra floor or uh, extending your shop 
two extreme cases like building a highway exit completely on their own informally. So I, I want to show you some of these examples. Um, how are we doing on time? We have uh, we have time. We have time. Shall yes, I continue? A any interjections yeah. or? We have an hour. Okay. Maybe we can stop uh, in uh, 30 minutes to okay. start with the questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Should, should I stop now, have questions? Yes, or are maybe. We yes. It's um, I don't want to speak like a lot without having feedback, but I sometimes I just... I would say, we, uh, I would say I w I'm looking forward to... To what happened to next. To know more, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but like if maybe someone, someone yeah. here or in the online, if... Uh, online we have uh, 12 people. Okay. I don't know if uh, we just ask them uh, if you have any question, we are here. Yeah. Well, I, the thing is, I wasn't sure how much back background information you need because I wasn't sure like are, if people are kind of familiar with Cairo because I could always, you know, jump into a, a case study, but I wasn't sure how much background information is needed to be able to contextualize the issues. But you, you can tell me. Have you been to Cairo before? <laughs> you have been. <laughs> okay, so this is a little redundant for you. It's ten bit. years ago. So oh, ten years ago. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you've been to Cairo. No? Okay. No. So but, uh, <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Can I ask yeah, something? Please. Yeah, because um, uh, you s you're telling that uh, all uh, all parts of uh, uh, in the Tahir uh, Square, mm, you saw all uh, kinds of people, young mm. and old, and yeah, rich yeah. and poor. And uh, I'm a bit surprised because um, uh, for us, uh, through the media, we were told that the rich people, they were kind of defending their uh, the mm. system because mm. they had privilege with the, mm. the president so but yes uh, well I mean first of all things at certain point people as I said were unified for a couple of weeks at the beginning everybody was behind the same cause Mubarak has to go everybody I would say the major West majority except of course the, like the cronies or the people who are supporting the regime but the majority of, of the people were, but after that cause was uh, achieved, then people started to divide, for sure. And not only uh, along class lines, but also you know, ideological lines, um, age generational thing, you tend to have older generation or people who are more established are pro-stability and enough is enough, let's go back to, have, because they have family, you have to support it. Whereas younger generation and students have more daring and they want to push the limit and we want more. So we have this sort of radicals. So it is generational, it is class, it is ideological. Uh, in, in some cases, there, there was some demonstration for Coptic, mostly Coptic rights, even if some Muslim were in the marshes, but we were defending the rights of Coptic minority to have equal rights, for example. Huh? And we have some Islamist, uh, political Islam groups leading certain marches for their own agenda. And so on, so, so yes, things start to get fragmented. But I, I, was, I was referring to the very, sort of almost like foundational moment in the very first month or so, but after that you're right. But can you see now uh, the, this kind of divisions in reflected in the political parties that people uh, Yes, have been formed in the to a certain extent, but but to be honest, that the political process is very very nascent, very early, because Egypt doesn't have a long experience. So most of the people who won in the election were people who had already grasped the space and were mostly Islamist groups. Yeah. Why? Because they were the NGOs working in informal communities for decades. And this is the same story that happened in Hezbollah and Hamas and this and Because when the state withdrew from the 70s, from providing all the services, so it was these groups who jumped into providing services. Education, health, elderly services, this and this and that. So they have grass in space. So when there was a political process, it was very short. So they were the one who had credibility. Whereas the liberals or the secularists were more sort of intellectuals and you know media talk shows but they don't have really big and that's that's sort of abc political science i mean you don't, you don't have to be you know but 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 i but so, so but i think now after a year or so
people are starting to realize that yes, we supported the Islamics, but looking at the performance in the parliament, some of, maybe some of them are having second. So that's part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. So it's now getting a little more interesting, but it's it's a long process. And as, and as you pointed out correctly, if you are a middle class or upper middle class, you can still sustain yourself for a year or two. But if you're a daily wager, after three months, you're fed up. I want the old regime, but I can sustain myself, mm -hmm. you know. So, so and, and I think the military rulers played on this. They dragged on, dragged on, and they made it sound like all these failures, we have, you know, a gas crisis, we have a electricity crisis, we have building being burned, explosion, and they made it sound and this is what the revolution brought you. Mm -hmm. So now one of these presidential candidates are actually presenting, who was like the former prime minister during Mubarak, so it's very ironic. And he's, he's now the second, you know, the second highest poll. Mm -hmm. Which means that a lot of people are saying, enough is enough, we want what we had without Mubarak, but at least we won't have some stability. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's quite complex. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. No question. So, shall we move forward? Should move forward. Okay. So, uh, I was thinking of showing two um, two examples. One of them <laughs> is a uh, a design studio I did with my students on downtown, which you saw. Yeah. And the other one was some of these uh, interventions that I referred to. One of the the things that happened during the one of them was a cafe coffee shop on a highway, built on a highway informally, another one is on a highway exit. So these are the two examples that I want to show. So I'll try to be um, a little concise. So I will start just to, uh, maybe I'll start with this one. Okay, so this is a very interesting quote that I was also having a discussion with a friend of mine, a sociologist, uh, Professor Tavio, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He's a, a professor of political science in Helsinki. He made this great quote. He said, he's paraphrasing Marx's quote, and he said, I've, he, he said, I've been to Peru and I saw the future, which is all the reverse of what used to happen in the 19th century when the third world was looking at the first world as its trajectory to the modern world, right? So India was looking to England, for example. Right? And, he, and he's claiming that we're living in a condition whereas Europe is looking to Latin America and Middle East and South Asia as what's going to happen to them in terms of, you know, flexible accumulation, formalization of labor, uh, you know, the conservative, sort of the global capital changing the society in, in a way that the third world has been suffering for, for decades. So I said, he said, I went to Peru and I saw what, would, what Finland would be like in 10 years. So you would lose all the public institutions, like what happened now. You have cuts for all cultural institutions, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have austerity measures. You have, you know, the governments like, you know, giving banks some loans. And so this all is a result of IMF and World Bank putting pressure on government to squeeze people more. So this is what, so what I, what I, what I, what I saw in this quote is an incredible process because Yes, there are some lessons to be learned from Cairo and the spring and, and, and whatever you want to call it. But there's also some fetishization of what happened in Cairo and Tahrir. And I think we need to talk about it a little bit more critically because, as you said, I think Tahrir has been presented in Western media, particularly the first two months or so, as sort of the ideal, clean, non-violent revolution led by educated middle class, Facebook generation. And, and everything messy was edited out. It had to be presented as the ideal model of revolution. And I think now the nuances are, are appearing. It's not as coherent and clean and, and I've learned. no, there's, it's messy like any other revolution. So, so yes, there are lessons to be learned, but we have to be a little bit critical and don't think of it as, you know, utopian sort of, it, nothing is, is like that. However, I, I, I think I think Tevio's uh, uh, professor uh, Tevio's uh, quote is is, is very is very uh, telling. Uh, here in this presentation, I was referring. So Cairo, for example, is relevant today not only because what happened in Tahrir, but even throughout night history, Cairo was one of the earliest example of this twin city, colonial versus native, 
So this kind of juxtaposition between, you know, westernized versus indigenous, what I want to call it, was always been there since the, f the founding of the modern state with this kind of contrast and paradox and almost uh, uh, inconsistency, some people would say, between, you know, in, quote unquote, imported models of westernization or modernization and local heritage. And I'm very against this kind of dichotomy, but I'm, uh, but I'm saying it's still, till today, part of the political discourse. Even in the current parliament, they're talking about, we cannot just, you know, have a constitution written in France or something. We have to have, you know, Islamist, this constitution, something like that. No? Um, so, yeah, so in this, here is, here is an image of Cairo, and you can see the, the, so the foot, this is the Nile, and this is the Delta, and this is the footprint of Cairo, and, um, so this is the Dubai on the Nile image as of right too. Huh? So this is sort of the way the city wanted to sell itself, to publicize itself to the outside world as sort of opulent, you know, clean crystal on the Nile. Huh? Whereas the thing that was edited out of the picture again was that mo the majority of people live in condition like that. But what was not something that the city, once I once gave a lecture, I, was, I used to live in, Vancouver, I once was invited to give a lecture to the Egyptian expats community in Vancouver because the consular or the ambassador was visiting or something. So I made a presentation and I, more or less, that was back in 2002 or something, and I talked about informalization and, and all these issues. And then after the talk, uh, one of the local Egyptian residents said, like, I, I can't believe you didn't show one single picture of Zamalek or Heliopolis, one of these up, you know, upscale neighborhoods and he was so furious because I was showing these images as if it's I'm sort of it's bad for the reputation of the, so it's 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 more important representation as opposed to the real condition so that I think I think this this mentality till today you know people are you know you can't do that how how would that be me represented in the Western media as opposed as if this is the key issue not not the issue that happened huh? um, okay so this is an important image because here you can see the red and the blue is the city core I was referring to. The green is the informal belt and the pink is this third type of desert cities which you have some images of. This very interesting kind of California style villas. Uh, but I want to jump to what I wanted to talk about here which is um, sorry, I'm recycling some. Uh, so this is also an important image because it shows you this encroachment on agricultural land. This is again the in informal development. And what I would like to talk about is the ring road. So around the year 2000, the city realized that informal fabric, which is here, this one, this one, has been so this is the this this railroad has used to be the official limit of the city everything inside it was designed and planned and organized according to the state and everything around it was random illegal needs to be demolished uh, so by the year 2000 this informal belt has grown so much it was impossible to to think of even deal with it. So what the people say, okay, we're going to have a new limit, a new ring road. So they built this ring road, which is so shown here, for many reasons, traffic reasons, but also to contain or to delimit further encroachment, to define the new city limit. And they said, okay, everything inside, we're going to acknowledge it, help you with infrastructure and this and that, but you cannot build anything outside. So it's a new line. But what's interesting about this ring road, it wasn't meant to give access to people there. It was meant to, it's like almost building a wall around the neighborhood. But we were not supposed, it wasn't intended for people living in this neighborhood to get into the highway. But it was only, you can, you can see it, but you don't can have access to it. So it is, a, it is as if you have, you, you're living in a desert and you desperate need water. So you have this kind of water pipe inside your property but you can't have water because it goes to somebody or somebody else but just so it was very frustrating so people start to find ways to tap into the mm -hmm. by doing stuff like i'm going to show you some of these examples 
So this is an image of the highway, of the ring roads, and these are the housing next to it. Um, and this is also the diagrams of the highway. And this is images from when it cuts through the neighborhood. You can see it's very narrow fabric. So sometimes you have to do a double decker because you can't afford to have a wide. So, um, and 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 this is this is this is from my car. For 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 many years. For the middle class, their experience of neighborhoods, that's before the revolution, was limited to watching it from the highway while driving. That's as far as they know about informal housing or in official media. But they wouldn't go inside. They have no reason. And the stereotypes goes both ways. So people who live in the middle class neighborhood, they think of these neighborhoods as slums, full of drugs, full of social ills, there are this and this and that. And the other way around, there's all stereotype. But, but I think this sort of seeing the city from through the window, it's like, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with like 19th century literature of 19th century tourism, you have this 19th century tourist taking the Thomas Cook boat along the Nile and watching the rural landscape, you call it from a codec distance. So you only see it while in the boat having your tea and something. So you only experience this other, this native, or whatever you want to call it, from a distance. You never engage in it, and you have these photos. So I, I think there is something similar here um, that is taking place. Um, and even, even in maps, the city was represented as, this is the city, but this is what? This doesn't belong to the city. Or in some to, 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 uh, traveler guides, Everything outside the city proper was blank. Doesn't exist. No maps. No street names. Nothing. So it's almost, you know, tabula rasa. Nothing there. So um, this is some of the images. So before, um, so the people started to find to find ways to get access to the highway, like this one, for example. So for example, here they would have little circ, and they use inside the neighborhood because it's so dense they use something called we call it tuk-tuk which is tricycle I think it was an Indian invention or something it's very common so people take this tuk-tuk stop here climb the staircase get on the highway get a micro bus so almost like a transfer point between formal and informal mm -hmm. or they build steel structures like that when the wall sometimes the highway is below level sometimes it's underneath so they have th these are all community organized uh, interventions um, and then the revolution took place and I, and, I, and I'm so 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 I, I here I talk about what happens you know since the revolution and people start taking advantage of the state security breakdown by building uh, overnight you know a building they like just add three floors in, in a week or something huh? and uh, In downtown, where you were a month, a year ago, uh, downtown used to be one of the most quote unquote orderly parts of the city where you still had a sidewalk, where you still more or less respect traffic light. But since revolution and because of Tahrir, all surrounding street has been taken over by street peddlers and merchants in a way that was completely unimaginable before. Hmm? So here I, I show some of these cases. Um, and they just spill over the street, they put all this stuff and even some of the, they are not only selling clothing but sometimes it's like rural economy coming to downtown which is incredible, I guess, selling cheese and vegetables in, a, in, in, in what used to be a middle class shopping area. So, so this kind of, this barrier is kind of blurred and you have people almost taking over what they see as their own because this, in Cairo a city is so dense, space is it's the premium. It's the, it's the most important commodity. So for somebody like this lady to have one meter by one meter, this is her own capital. So everybody claims a meter square, and they have they bring this this uh, I don't know if I have image of it here. This okay. So we have we have a big tray, one meter by one meter, and a barrel, and that's their furniture. So they come with a barrel full of like socks, for example, and then they come in the morning, they put the table, they stack the thing, and that's 
the business for one day and then the evening they put it back and leave and that's um, okay I'm gonna move a little faster this will be done. okay so I'm, I was very interested to look at what happened on this highway uh, not only this access point but what other things that people are you know you know highway means it's a freeway you're not supposed to stop however people start to sell little things put like a, a tea stand a coffee shop um, cafeterias selling juice hmm? and then eventually this is the one of the examples I want to show is or, or, or even car repair um, car repair shops huh? so this guy for example here <coughs> the store is behind the wall so what he did is he created this device which is a ladder mm -hmm. so the car stops here and they have like the the what the uh, air pressure hose and everything is in the back and then I, I photographed the same guy you know a few months after and then he completely you know started step by step and now this is on the highway you're not supposed to stop but um, now I, I have two case studies here one of them is a is a, is a coffee shop another one is the highway exits uh, one is here and this this is oh. okay so this is the ring road again so we call this the southern arc and this is the northern arc because this is coffee shop here and this is the highway exit here so the coffee shop um, Linus Cafe. So this is the highway and this is the retaining wall. And this guy made a, a very interesting intervention. Not only he put some chairs, but he started to build. This is the location. See how dense the neighborhood is. Yeah? And so what he did is he built, he had to create. Uh, so he chose a point where people get on this staircase to take the microbus. And at this point here, and then what he did is it's a family of two brothers. He had to do this little structural intervention to make room. So he leveled this retaining wall, um, which is beyond putting a chair. It requires some structural know-how, certain investment. You have to bring water, electricity, uh, gas, uh, and you have to make sure that this is structurally sound. So I, I went and talked to these guys um, so okay sorry it's just moving to okay so and then after this one did it so there's another guy who imitated it so so they're almost like a little kind of structures tapping onto the highway which is the means of transportation which means business for them and they're mostly catering for microbus drivers and taxi drivers who stop for tea break on the highway huh? and they they found a certain deal with the police so so long as they he said to me he told me that so long as they, do, they don't put shares outside then it's it's okay it's tolerable huh? so these are a couple of images of mm -hmm. so, so he, this is another this is another uh, example of this um, then then the second example that I wanted to show is the uh, highway exit that was built also uh, during the revolution this is the location of it so this is one juncture this is another juncture and the area in between there is no access for all these people so they needed some access point here so what they did here what they did is um, so this is what it looks like before this is the this is the two junctures this one is here this one is here and this one that is lacking. So what they did is they started out with a dirt tramp, a little kind of half paved ramp like that. Uh, this is actually another one in the making after the first one was done. So that was probably what it used to be like before it was structured. So they added a little dirt road to, to enter or to get access to the highway. And then, um, Computers are slow, um, and then they built a full deal uh, exit ramp here and there. There's another better, better image coming up here. So this ramp or exit to the highway and the staircase was constructed uh, entirely by the community. Here another view. 
And then the, the, the key thing is, after they built it, they didn't just build it and say, uh-huh, we built it and nobody can change it because it's revolution. But they were, they were very smart because what they did is they uh, made a CD with a little PowerPoint presentation and a soundtrack, which I have, I don't know if I have, I have a clip of it, I don't know if we can show it here. And they presented to the governor of Cairo, of Giza, sorry, this is in Giza. And they invited him to come and open the ribbon. So in a way, they, they sought, they were seeking legitimacy, legitimacy. And not only the governor came and acknowledged it, but they, the, the, the governor opened a traffic police point underneath. This is where the flag is. So it became formalized, legitimized, even though it started out by the local. And of course, this kind of project, this is, this is a, you know, a million pound kind of, it's huge investment and requires mobilization, fundraising, technical expertise, including you know, engineering, uh, knowledge of code, and they, some of this they had in the community. So some people contributed with sand or bulldozer or this or that, but some of the ex technical expertise that they didn't have, they subcontracted in a discreet way some engineers in the municipality to come and tell them how to do it. So it's a very interesting kind of subversive, or you want to call it subversive, you want to call it like resourceful way to make sure that what they want, they're going to do is going to be accepted by traffic engineers, so, you know, to a certain extent. So the question of code here is something that is very interesting. And going back to the first image, what is actually a code? Uh, is it, you know, to have a street that is 20 meter wide, is that something that is we need to abide by? Or we can live with like six meter as long as we, you know, uh, we, as long as we respond to question of, you know, uh, fire and em emergency and ventilation and this, so so again, this is another kind of local code or or pra or, or standards learned from local practices uh, that that we, we need to kind of uh, I I to work on a little bit. Um, so so I um, I wanted to show. Um, um, do, do we do we do we have uh, opportunity to show some clip of the thing or no? Clip, uh, video clip. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. The problem is the PC. computer is not yes, ready. Yes, maybe. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm gonna show a, a quick uh, example of the work I did with Matthias in downtown, and then and then. We sh sh should we take some questions now, or just? I just uh, typed any questions. Ask uh, in the chat, but uh, at the moment, any question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, maybe here. I have questions, have but uh, yes. I think I'm, I will wait until you okay. finish your presentation. Okay. It's been an hour already, mm -hmm. huh? Yes, we have uh, 30 minutes more. I think uh, we can start uh, with yeah. the debate. Okay, I'm just going to have a quick run on this, okay. this project. Like I take like five or ten minutes and then... Yeah. Okay, so, so p part of my work I do with my students is look at uh, urban space, the interface between uh, public and private. And I, in this project, it was right after the evolution, uh, we were interested in looking at the gaps between buildings and what you call it, in between spaces or like in anthropological terms we call it liminal space or uh, um, um, a transitional space or uh, but but to me it's a metaphor of this in between space is not just between two buildings but between public and private it was between formal and informal it was the space during the evolution as I said where people were using uh, bet during the street fight to sit and talk about constitutional amendments. And so it was sort of the, the beginning of the Habermasian public sphere, the space where people were discussing, you know, it's, it's civic society emerged in these kind of little cracks. Huh? And also metaphorically, when, if you say Cairo now, or Egypt is, is going from a process where, where, where a former regime has collapsed and another one is still in the making. And so this transitional period is something that I think these spaces are very uh, uh, um, almost um, 
they have the potential to accommodate this kind of this, this condition. So this condition of in is a project that I work with my students. I'm going to do a quick, this is a design project, so it has a lot of kind of designy thing. So we first, of course, we go downtown and we walk through these kind of little spaces between buildings. We document them. Uh, and then, um, the students start to build a model, very large scale, one to 2,000 just to get a sense of the city fabric and we have our sessions. Part of the studio was that it was after evolution, the idea was to take this, the class outside the classroom and, and, and we were organizing the sessions, most of the sessions, some of the sessions inside cafes or, or some of these spaces um, and, and sort of challenge this kind of pedagogical kind of hierarchy. And then each group of students um, um, took a chunk of downtown, like one super block, and they started looking at it in detail, documenting its history, its character, its social condition, and um, with, with certain reviews, of course. And then we started to build a model of downtown using uh, cardboards to simulate this kind of spaces. And that was a process that was very, um, took a lot of time, but also gave us a feel of how th how these kind of different groups, it's almost like a puzzle. Um, images. I'm just gonna throw this, run through this quickly. Um, then, can I just scroll from here? Just, okay. Um, Okay, now the second, and, and then, so the idea was to use this model to propose certain interventions in these spaces to promote a more inclusive and more democratic public space that we were talking about. So the space, public space became a, a metaphor for this phase we're going through. So how can this public space be accessible to women, for example, to elderly people, to people with physical disability? to uh, people from different economic backgrounds. So instead of having public space as taking over, but young, you know, middle class uh, and, and used only for cafes and restaurants. So how can we promote more diverse uses and engage more diverse groups of society? So it became like a microcosm of what we would like to see in public space in general. So it, it's like an increment of a whole. Um, so we, we we're starting to propose some of these ideas and then <coughs> we also took the model and we did some community discussion downtown. This is one of the coffee shops and this is a screen that they show TV, the football games on. So we made a, a, a arrangement with the, with the owner to allow us to use it for our presentation and in return we bring business. So it was sort of a, another kind of, um, way to engage communities and this is very very slow computer even like m i thought mine was the was the word okay uh, so this is all images of constructing the model okay maybe we can just skip to the i just want to show you some of the because the next stage was to um was for for students to start building A, a, a model like a larger model huh? and these models were for them uh, each one would, would would look at one of these spaces and propose a, a certain um, okay, so we're here. intervention <coughs> some images of them working in the studios and we were less interested in the f in the form or the aesthetic or the the final product but more interested in the process so that what they what w whatever they propose has to be uh, tested by engaging 
whoever is living in the neighborhood and proposing this idea and working uh, in different um, Um, okay, maybe I should stop here because this, this is very heavy um, PowerPoint presentation. I don't think it's moving with that. So, so let's just wrap up the, this, you know, main presentation, and then maybe through question and answers, we could uh, we could revisit some of them. So, so the main idea was I was trying to to do in this rather long and incoherent presentation is to 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 discuss with with you what was the revolution. Uh, what what was relevant about the revolution in terms of the city and public space, both in terms of practice and also in terms of some of the uh, pedagogy, like student uh, engagement in public space. I'm now currently involved in very interesting projects that I'm just going to talk to you briefly without showing images. Uh, similar to this highway uh, project, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a neighborhood next to it. There was a piece of land, it's a piece of land that is owned by the government, uh, the only remained undeveloped area, and the government is proposing a housing project. Of course, which is the, the most illogical thing to do in such densely populated is to build more houses, because everybody builds houses, but what we need is public facilities. So the community there, uh, they didn't like the idea, and they stood up to the bulldozers, literally, and they said, no, we're not going to let you build these houses, and they escalated the the, the, this fight, and they talked to the local MP, who was a local, uh, relatively progressive, and they took the issue to the prime ministerial level, and they requested that this par this park, this piece of land, be converted, designated into a park. Um, so, for some reason, the prime minister thought it's a good idea. So he stopped this housing project and he said, "Let's make this project a park." So I'm working with this community on with a team, some of colleagues, on voluntary basis to translate their dreams and aspiration into a physical plan, a technical proposal to be presented to the authority. Uh, it's a very complicated political process. There are five ministries involved in this project. Everyone has stakes in it. So we're negotiating a lot of political decision-making uh, process as well as doing this. And this project is located in a very strategic area between the formal and informal. So we're looking at as a model to restructure this distorted relationship between the two parts of the city into, from one of exclusion and marginalization into one of integration and uh, sort of mutual mutual benefit. So this project, I think, you know, it's too early now to show you some of the images because it's also we're not, I'm not supposed to d disclose uh, what we have now. But this is to me a very important project in this phase. It's not only the the project itself, its location, its program, but also the process whereby it started is initiated by the communities. My client is not the government, not a private investor, but my client is local community. And, and I, I think this is to me what's revolutionary about what's happening in Cairo, is the role of architects and planners now being restructured, transformed into something from being pat patron, the patron being the state to the patron being local community. So let's let's stop here and and maybe through question we can elaborate a little bit. Wow, thank you, thank you so much, Omar. And Sorry, I'm very you tired. You and leave and us <laughs> with this super exciting project you are working on now. We so there's a lot of uh, challenges there, yeah. I yeah. guess. Uh, so I don't know if anybody has questions. Maybe we can leave room for for you guys anybody wants yes um, um, i found find the student work <laughs> very interesting yeah um you mentioned that um, a, pos a part of the course was about uh, presenting or communicating with the neighborhood people living there mm -hmm. um, how was the process of um, communication receiving uh, with community and what kind of feedback you get? And uh, yeah, in what way did it uh, also maybe um, change the project? Yes, of course. This is a this is a academic project. It's not a real project. Okay. So so the, the the key is to to teach students a methodology. Okay. 
the, 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 the timing, the, lim the limitation of the time doesn't allow for, to make a project and take it to the community and then change and do it. But you have to establish the, the process, the methodology. So for example, before this studio is, the context is very important. So before we do any design decision, we spend half the semester in the, in the community. First, you need to learn who these are. Who are your clients? Huh? Who are the different members of the community? Are they the shop owners, the residents, the shoppers, the drivers, um, passerbys? How can you define who, who, is, who, is, who decides what happens in the public space? People living around it, people driving by it. So this is, this is an important question to define your community first. And then there's a lot of sort of um, pedagogical kind of data gathering and analysis. We do it. So we have questionnaires, we have interviews, we have mapping, we have historical maps. So there's a lot of information driven from the community by sketching it. Hmm? And then the model becomes itself a tool. So for some people living there, they don't necessarily understand drawing. But if you bring the model and put it, and the guy, the coffee maker, oh, the coffee shop say, oh, this is my coffee shop. So they automatically identify with a physical product as opposed to an abstract plan or section. So and, and and some of the draw some of the images are very interesting because you find like a cat moving on the model, which was to me it was very interesting because the sense of relaxed and informality that took place. Right? Uh, so during this session with the model, people we would take note of what people suggest. So we say, for example, we were thinking of this space instead of only being a coffee shop, we would have a stage here, and every month we would have a new performance. What do you think? They go, no, 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 that's gonna you know you know, exclude customers, or it's going to bring noise, and somebody else, yes, but what kind of performance? Or are we going to bring lighting, or sound, the wild kind of noise? So, f f so we don't have like a formal way of, you know, asking people what want, and then, but we, through discussions, we, uh, we keep our eyes open and hear what people, and then trans transform or translate these ideas into another layer, and then go back to them. Okay. We were here two weeks ago, and you suggested that we made that, what do you think? So the model is, 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 is a tool of, of communication, and that's how we did it. But in a real project, however, if that was a real project, you're right, after we finish, we make, a, and this is what we're doing in the park. When, once we finish the project, we have to make like a public presentation, okay. like a sort of public hearing. And then people would look at the thing and say, no, we wanted a park, because they ask now, we ask that they wanted a, a school, a, a medical center, playgrounds, cultural center, theater, so we're doing that now, and we're going to present it to them with images, and and then going to tell us, yes, but this school is too small, or we want to have boys and girls separately, for example, mm -hmm. or we want to have more green space and less, or we want to have walls or this. So, and then we can go back to the drawing board and change. Of course, our role is to negotiate the needs of the community and the aspiration into technical. Mm -hmm. Technically appropriate drawing. So if you if you want if they want to have let's say a road, we have to make sure the road is appropriate, mm -hmm. and so on. So forth. More questions? No. How how are they organizing themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. In, in these neighborhoods, these are very <coughs> tightly knit, you know, the term, like they're very close. There's a sense of community there, so people know their neighbors. Usually there are local organizations, most of which are re religious organizations, and the head of this organization are big community leaders, so when they ask, people trust them. So when they say, we want to collect 50,000 pounds to buy sand and, and hire a bulldozer and this and that. People trust that they're, these people are trustworthy through experience, so people give money to them knowing that they're gonna spend it the right way. So there's a history of community organization inside these neighborhoods that make these projects possible. It's not like you go somewhere and nobody knows anybody and say, we would like, and you write the paper and say, we would like to have donation. No, that's not the way to work. Maybe it happened in the mosque after the prayer, I say after the prayer, please, we're having this fundraising because we want to build the highway exit, which will save you all the trip to go around this, which will make it faster, easier, and more accessible. But we were asking for donation in kind. Some people donated 
pebbles, for example, or asphalt. Hmm? Some one of the guys, electrician, he collected scrap metal. Uh, this is what was the video they couldn't show. Uh, when they built the highway, they put like light poles, and there was some left over, and they just threw it. You know, like pieces of tubes, steel tubes. So the guy collected the tube and he welded them, and he made exactly the same light poles. He's an electrician. He probably was hired as a subcontractor by the government, so he knows. He's, he knows. So, so they they really good in building on this kind of individual resources. Um, it, it's it's an amazing it's an amazing story because it's also very to me it's a it's very new. It's almost a new model emerging. Yes, there has been almost this kind of participatory thing in literature since the 70s of participatory planning. But it's always started with the planners wanted to do participatory. This is what I'm doing here. But this is the opposite. It's the people who started and then they invited planners or officials. But they took the first step. So it's, it's, it's literally urbanization from below. And that's what's so fascinating. And that could not have happened before the revolution because the state would not allow this to happen for many reasons because you know religious fundamentalism you know you don't want to give people more power so they can challenge your authority so it's always kind of putting a lead over this kind of bubbling but once the pressure cooker exploded it's no longer possible to put it back it's very messy yes the kitchen is very messy but you have to really find a way to, re to, to create a new framework maybe a bigger pot, maybe whatever it is. But you have to have a framework that's more inclusive and allow all these voices and energy. And I think it's also, this project is very interesting because I don't think it's just a matter of, you know, an alternative way. I think that's, for a city like Cairo, this is the only way. Because imagine having, I don't know, 8 million <coughs> people living in this area. You don't have even the resources to, do, to upgrade these neighborhoods. You don't have the political will to, to, to demolish everything. So the only way is to to accept. Okay, let 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 us leave the people start, and we give them legitimacy and technical harm formalization. So I don't think it's 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 yet another uh, model. I think that's the only option. A city like Cairo and other cities in the in the developing world that it just economic condition is incredibly difficult. That there's, there's no way the city can manage all these problems on a smaller scale so people are so what you can do is to coordinate and you know organize and put like a larger framework but let the people decide what they want help them get started and then give them technical support and, I, and that's why i think it's a fascinating project and the park that i'm working on now is similar to that i don't know if there is any questions from the internet okay the then I'm gonna take my turn, okay? <laughs> yeah, please. Because I, I am very curious to to know. You have been describing this new scenario, which leaves room for new possibilities for to develop projects and ideas. Yes. From the base, from the bottom the, up. Yeah, and that it, this could n have never happened before. And but at the same time, you al also described how. This new scenario also leaves room for the state to build uh, walls, concrete walls in the mm. in the middle of the city, mm. and so uh, you are picturing somehow a very tense and contradictory mm. uh, mm, uh, situation. That and my question is: What is the outcome from the point of view of a daily routine? So what are, are we are obviously getting new situations with a lot of potential to improve conditions and also to raise awareness about for people to about their environment and their city but at the same time I guess we are losing some freedom in some other mm. context so from a day to day basis how people how this new context affect to people hmm. uh, well if I understand the question correctly I think okay well let me just say that the, the situation now is very messy it's not like we know where we're going even every day there's a new 
battle there's a new problem so, yeah so it's it's very unpredictable so nobody knows exactly there is sort of a sense of political process but every once in a while it gets sabotage and we go back to square one and the city is a manifestation of that there are different okay when the state whether the state has really collapsed or and I believe that it is purposely withdrawing to create this to construct this chaos I think the ruling military now is decidedly manufacturing or letting things fall apart to increase the discontent by the majority towards the revolution so let's say this is what happened because of the revolution so people are more alienated mm -hmm. uh, so 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 this sort of breakdown and the city traffic is worse the, there is crisis in in every walks of life so on daily basis things are much more difficult <coughs> uh, so in many ways a lot of people are as I said saying enough is enough but I think the thing that is makes one a little bit more hopeful is that there is something that's changed that I think I think is irreversible that is people are no longer fearing authority so no matter what happened, no matter problem, no matter how many walls they put, people are still going to fight back. And this is positive or negative because, you know, it's positive thing because people are empowered, they feel that they have the ability to change. But it's also a bit, a bit, yani, it could be tricky because if you even suggest another framework for development, even if it's you know, it will benefit the majority. You will find some people again protesting it, just to the, f the fact that they they can protest. So now I was I was I was talking to you on my way here that my students, for example, we're talking about the pedagogy, like why I think architecture education in Cairo is not very good. It lacks critical thinking, mostly about technical skills and less about abstract thinking and questioning. And we were talking about you know how the revolution meant for many young people just it's like you know a kid who just wants to say no to his parents just for the sake of saying no this is the stage we're at people are just protesting for the sake of protesting but there is no alternative vision yet because we're still in the process and we don't have the critical distance but but i think eventually things will the dust will settle and things will start to have but we're talking years i don't think by the time you come, things are still going to be messy. Uh, however, some of these barriers they put are now taking out. So, with some pressure, so there are two streets that were blocked, now they're open. Because pressure from the residents, or pressure from the parliament. So, things are not fixed. I call this condition we're at a flux, city in flux, a very fluid condition. Every day, there's a new wall up, a new wall down, a street rooted, something happened you know a, a building set on fire a new battle so every day the city has completely different not completely but some part of the city is changing so this condition of fluidity has potential but it's also problematic because you cannot really predict or, or plan or you know yeah you cannot really extra you know you cannot plan something now everything is just in a very everything is changing in the moment so so we're all sort of participating in a process that we hope in the right direction and, and do you think that people is uh, also uh, aware of this potential in the sense of they want to play a active role like in all levels not just trying to improve your conditions but also thinking that you can make a, a statement you can change things you can well I, I think it differs I think you know I, I think many people now are just want to make a living hmm? and I don't think that's bad in itself because you know you have to pursue your live but but I think one of the good things that happened since the revolution this is the, the sort of the emergence of civil society so different coalitions different groups for example in, in our field architecture events like there are many many initiatives Collectives, you call it collectives. Now that's the sexy term. You don't say initiative. You don't say organize initiative. So every five or six people are putting initiative 
like Basurama was an initiative and then turned into established practice. But now we have initiative for the right to housing, initiative for public space, initiative for, I don't know, um, uh, freedom of expression, initiative for this. So all these initiatives are concerned with public space in different way, or the city in different way, and we're meeting and we're intersecting. And level of uh, uh, groups uh, yeah, civil society is a good word for it and I, and I think this is very hopeful like you know the fact I'm being here and I've given a talk and I'm giving like five six talks in the last year or so I'm going to Lisbon to give another talk so there's an interest in engaging these issues and that generates certain energy and it has a ripple effect so downtown for example is becoming now mushrooming with art spaces and you know uh, creative uh, sort of centers for artist studios and um, and uh, multimedia studios and uh, open theaters and art festivals and every week there is something happening and I, and I think this energy will definitely have an effect um, I, I don't know what's gonna the big song gonna be tomorrow in the city but, but there's a new vision of what the city should be like by concerned citizens not necessarily ex experts you know, there are lawyers involved, there are shop owners involved, there are business owners, all the students, there are architects, artists, and all these sub-communities are thinking we need to have downtown better functioning, right? More spaces for art, more spaces for the... So this is, this is to me, a very positive sign. Even though on the street is very frustrating as we speak, but I think there's something happening here. So I try to be hopeful, Yanni, but... Well, let me say that I, I totally agree with what you just said. And for me, being in Cairo last year uh, was the best way to to really see how people, this energy you are talking about, you can see it, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. And having you here is also a great way to experience this energy because we are, when when you talk about Cairo, I think I agree also that we are looking at the future mm -hmm. in many ways. So. We need to also discover all this room for possibilities, room for potential here in in our local uh, communities and environments. And this is a fantastic presentation. I don't know if, if anybody I else. I have just another question. How, uh, you think, uh, how you think is changing the local identity in Cairo? Mm. I mean, uh, you think uh, people are, are happy with these new identities uh, building now in, in Cairo. You know, I, I mean, about, uh, also about uh, what you are uh, saying uh, about this ugly, ugly housing or uh, talking about um, the, this, new pos this new identity of uh, uh, Cairo. You're talking about the physical identity or the... Uh, both. How how you think is changing now this identity? How people uh, feel uh, this new urban identity related with this uh, revolution and this uh, new practice, these new dynamics uh, mm. that are happening? Well, the question of identity is a bit, yani, uh, entangled. It's hard yes. to. I mean, I I don't believe there's something called uh, yani, but 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 I think what 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 my perception from the discussion I think at least at least the very least that the people who are living thinking that this phenomena on the city's side, periphery does not exist or is full of this has been demystified so people at least now acknowledge that there's there's another people who are also Egyptian citizens or Kyrene citizens who have been living in these neighborhoods for so long and we never cared about them. Mm. So that's a big, big plus. Acknowledging or, or sort of crossing the barrier, psychological barrier between you and the other. So that's, to me, key. Now, this encounter is not necessarily pleasant. Sometimes it's violent. Sometimes in Tahrir you have harassment. Mm. 
the different codes of ethics and different values. The different. Some people are more conservative. Some people are more liberal. Some people think they are. These guys are. You know. How can they? You know. Like you know. I don't know. There. Let's let's say there are different the cultural values in different communities. Not necessarily in this two part, but in general, like in a different. Co but at least there is acknowledgement, and that's the key thing that difference exists, and it's okay to have difference. So there is. This myth of that we're all having sharing the same value has fallen, and that's that's key. Hmm? And that was this is a pressure cooker. The, the the state managed for 40 years to create this myth that we have something called Egyptian identity that is secular, modern, yes. middle class, whatever it is. Huh? And now everybody say, well, maybe we're not. We have really some religious groups. We have fundamentalist group. We have secular groups. We have Muslim. We have Christians. We have Nubians. We have this. So all of a sudden people are like, oh my God, Egypt is so diverse. How can we deal with this? But at least the fact that this question is raised and acknowledged, that's the beginning of a healthy process. And that's, that's very clear in the presidential candidate election we're having now. Mm -hmm. We have, I think now 13 candidates. And so the first time I would have never imagined two years ago that we have like a presidential debate on TV between two or three people debating their programs. That's something completely foreign to us. Not that we're not capable, but it wasn't allowed to happen. It was only the, yes. the Mubarak being re-elected hmm, in a fair election, and, and that's it. But now we have somebody who's political Islamist, representing political Islam in a very clear, untrying way. Another one, moderate, Islamic but moderate. One very left-wing, and one former regime survivor and one yeah so we have five or six options this is great huh <laughs> and we we had a female candidate but she, she never made she didn't have collected the enough <coughs> you have to have enough signatures to run but, but okay but there is the, the possibility of having a woman as a so to me this is i think this is the space of possibility that we're living now it's not the space of solution it's space of possibility yes it is possible in 10 years to have a relatively fair democracy. It's not happening now. But it's, uh, yes, it is possible in 20 years to have a female president. This is great. Maybe for the next generation. But to me, to imagine the, the possibility is the first step in the right direction. Same thing with the city. To imagine the possibility that these people will have a say in how the city would be. So, for example, the, the, the city, if you look at the the distribution of resources till two years ago you have let's say 80 percent of the money going to build highways for private cars but the people who use private cars are let's say 10 percent whereas 20 percent of the budget going for public transit who is used by 80 percent so that's a political decision huh? so that could be revised now so this idea of the city becoming more democratic means the urban conditions become more fair and more just or less injustice so so yes it, these are all steps in the right direction but I, I think it's gonna take long and messy and you know full of hurdles but uh, but I come to Madrid and I see, I, I see the future <laughs> <laughs> no but Madrid has wonderful examples of public space I was very very and he's excited to see all these examples, like the, the middle-sized spaces and the area. What, what's the, the area I talk, I walked today, I told you about? Uh, Malasagna. Malasagna. Very interesting. No, this is not a piece, I think. Malasagna? Malasagna, ah, so and also I went yesterday. What you written was Malasagna. But Malasagna was today, <laughs> and yesterday I went to... Uh, to uh, Lava Pies. And, yeah, and yeah, and other places. But okay. this nineteenth-century fabric being not totally gentrified, but soft, soft gentrification, like good balance. I think good balance. It's like you know Greenwich, in New York, or downtown East Side. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's no longer any you know, traditional neighborhood, but it has a mix of young and old, and old economy and new economy. And, and I think this is good. This is good for cities. This renewal place, part of the renewal. And I, and I think this is what we need to learn. 
in terms of intervention, in terms of the process. Yeah. So, so we will look forward to your visit and to give us some insights, yeah, so some yeah. prescription, <laughs> some prescription, <laughs> the Madrid prescription. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I don't know if yes, we have. I just time asking for, for a new question or any, any new question. I think you might uh, be. No, no, I'm good. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm just afraid. Like by the, you know, I was, my pace was going. I've been walking for 12 hours the last two days. It's been wonderful, but I'm, and the tapas and the beer are just taking over. Like <laughs> it's like between. It's really nice. You need to leave to keep some energy for tomorrow uh, and this one. <laughs> this one's gonna be another situation. We'll, we'll manage. <laughs> okay, so maybe we. Close. Yeah, this yeah. fantastic session. Well, thank you for also <laughs> the opportunity to use this high tech uh, thing. I'm thinking now of making a Facebook account since I'm yes. already <laughs> entering the new 21st and also century. Twitter. And a Twitter. Yes. yes. <laughs> Just got my smartphone. That's my new kind of. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ah, maybe oh. we have the. Are fighting again. The same. final question. Neighborhoods. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yes, it. Okay, good question. In Cairo, there are areas in Cairo that had undergone a uh, threat of gentrification and were partially gentrified, like the part on the Nile that I told you about. This was an old historic low income neighborhood purchased by uh, capitalists or high investment companies with the endorsement of the government the last 10, 15 years, and turned into high-rise office buildings, hotels, uh, and, and of course, that creates a certain change in the land value, which means that some people who used to live there can longer live there, so they're pushed out. So that's, that happened. Uh, you didn't want to retain, no, it's fine. <laughs> No, thank you for your question. <laughs> but in downtown, that's something that is now currently happening. Downtown is now undergoing, I, I call it competing trajectories. So you have in downtown, let's say, the artists' movement and the avant-garde. The, so the people like uh, Benha or you know some architects, some artists, some uh, uh, journalists, students activists, this, this is the new generation, the Facebook generation that sort of spearheaded the Tahrir events. So this is one, one trajectory of downtown. And then you have another trajectory, which is the government plans of downtown, which was basically something a little bit interesting because it was exa it's exactly what, 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 what didn't happen. So the, 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 the government plans was to clean downtown and restore the architecture, heritage, and glory and sort of push out all these peddlers and poor people because downtown is sort of a, a hidden treasure that needs to be unraveled for tourists and this and that. So, so that's another kind of vision for downtown. And the third vision is exactly going back to your question with real estate developers eyeing downtown on, on purchasing already properties. Uh, they have bought, I think, 20 properties downtown now. And their idea is to turn it from uh, I don't know if you know downtown. It's it's, it's rather for, yeah. And it, most of the buildings have interesting architecture, but they're in a very bad condition because of the bad infrastructure and rent control and so on. It's a long story, but but these investor or real estate companies are actually interested in turning some of these buildings into upscale and five-star restaurants and boutique hotels. Which, if that happens, will definitely create nodes or or focal points of gentrification similar to what happened in Lower East Side. So there is a concern, but the, the good news is people are aware of that and we are not necessarily fighting them, but we are engaging them. We're talking to them and we're trying to, to, to show them that it, downtown is more interesting when it has multi-layers, as opposed to having one group or one class background or one group with ideological. So downtown is all about diversity and inclusiveness. So we're but now there's a process of trying to safeguard uh, 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 this process of development without gentrification. But that's definitely another talk. Um, maybe I'll do it by uh, similar high tech from Cairo. Maybe you can, uh, nice. Domenico can come and give us a little bit of a 
session from Cairo, introduce this high tech thing and can do another session. And then you can give a talk then okay. about, about Madrid, yeah. Yeah. I had the opportunity to wander around alone downtown out of tourism and I loved it. Great. Well, come back, come again, and <laughs> come back, email me, and then I give you a little tour. I had, I had wonderful tour guides yesterday and today, my colleagues. It's been in incredible. That's the, 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 the fact, the privilege of walking the city with somebody who's in the same neighborhood makes a huge difference. Um, it's in the intricacy and the, it's, 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 it's been fantastic. And so whoever is interested to come to Cairo, I'll, can you put my email? And yeah, yes, I, I put in contact. Uh, yeah, you. and then you can yes. come and, and I charge not too much for a tour. I is the idea <laughs> creating new new network between people? Yeah, yeah. I have a small studio downtown <laughs> that I started, what is that? I even got lost in one of those neighborhoods. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's part of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, for everybody, for your for listening, for being so patient with my incoherence, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all, some of you in Cairo, when you get a chance. I'll be happy to take you around. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. So I just uh, wait. Stop. Say to stop. Or? Yes. To stop. I want to do like the yes, just stop. the button. Job. <laughs> The red button. <laughs>